Good evening, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Jeffrey, and this program this evening is brought to you by the East Central Illinois chapter of the University of Illinois Extension Master Naturalist Program. I would like to begin today by recognizing and acknowledging as part of the U of I, we are on the lands of the Peoria, the Kaskaskia, Piankashaw, Weir, Miami, Mescouten, Odawa, Sauk, Meskaki, Kikapu, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, Odawa, and Chickasaw nations. These lands were the traditional territory of these native nations prior to their forced removal. These lands continue to carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. As a land grant institution, the University of Illinois has a particular responsibility to acknowledge the peoples of this land, as well as the histories of dispossession that have allowed for the growth of this institution for the past 150 years. We're also obligated to reflect on and actively address these histories and the role that this university has played in shaping them. This acknowledgement and the centering of native people is a start as we forward the next 50, 150 years. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to remind you that after the talk, you could fill the survey at the bottom of the Zoom link that brought you in here. Also, please use the chat function um, to ask questions and those will be answered at the end of the program. This evening's talk will be recorded uh, and that will be available on YouTube channel that is also on the bottom of your Zoom link. So, in contemporary American culture, nature is often construed as existing out there. Somewhere, especially in parks and preserves, but there's not, that's not where most of us are living. Through a slideshow of photographs taken close to home and to work, Rob Cantor encourages people to cultivate their appreciation of the wild creatures that live among us. The presentation will be followed by a discussion. Come, learn, and have fun. Let me tell you a little about Rob Cantor. He is a clinical associate professor in the School of Earth, Society and Environment at the University of Illinois, where he teaches courses in environmental communications and issues and serves as an academic advisor. He also writes and narrates uh, Environmental Almanac, which many of you will have heard now and then. It's a weekly program that runs um, as a column in the Sunday edition of the Champagne News Gazette and um, our radio commentary on AM 580 and other NPR affiliated um, uh, programs. So without further ado, Rob, we are delighted that you were able to come and speak to, the, to us this evening. Take away. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. And thanks, uh, I, I was gonna say thank you, Master Naturalists, because I was thinking that this would be a predominantly uh, Master Naturalist group I was talking to, but as I flip through the uh, what I could see of attendance on Zoom before, I realize it's not. So anyway, thank you, Master Naturalists and other peoples here uh, for the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, Normally, when I, I have uh, do a talk like this, I have a slide presentation running behind me, 
And I kind of alternate between reading from prepared notes and riffing uh, about the photographs on the screen. In a similar vein this evening, I'll just talk into my laptop while I share a screen with you. So there's nothing formal about this at all. I, I think it's an easier thing to do uh, in person than via a laptop, but this is what we got to work with. So, so that's how we'll do it uh, this time around. If you ever want to invite me back, I, I'm happy to speak in person though. Um, at the outset of this uh, presentation, I, I want to just say something about the couple of contexts uh, in, in which it's given. And not that I'm going to tie these things all together or make sense of them for you, just to let you know that I understand that I understand where I'm speaking because I think sometimes I, I come across as as uh, impossibly uh, uh, satisfied with the world as it is. But as you know, um, one of the contexts for for uh, talking about wildlife is the uh, ongoing. Uh, destruction of biodiversity that, you know, humans are choosing. Uh, I, I guess the way I think of it is that, you know, we are, we are every day choosing our own uh, convenience and privilege over the diversity of life around us. Um, and what that leads to is, is headlines like this. Fungi de decimating amphibians are worse than we thought. Time is running out in the tropics. Ocean fish stocks on verge of collapse. Last of its kind, the saddest photograph you'll ever see of a rhino. Silence, guys. Billions of North American birds have vanished from the skies. All of it kind of summed up in the title of Elizabeth Colbert's book from a few years back, The Sixth Extinction. As I said, this is a context. This is an important one for what I'm saying, but I'm not going back to tie it together because I'm going to show you things that are, are doing okay. Another context um, that I just want to acknowledge here that, that makes it a little bit weird to show pictures of bugs and birds and things from around my yard is that people all over the world uh, through our screens and, and we have access to some of the coolest life on the planet. And, you know, I, it's totally understandable to me that uh, we forget to look out the window now and again, because who wants to look at robins through a dirty window when you can look at birds of paradise in stunning HD. And this probably won't work in, in uh, the presentation for you, but uh, this is just the ad. And, and again, it's probably not running for you, but I'm watching David Attenborough and his seven worlds, one planet trailer. And it's just stunning. The music, the uh, production values, the amount of just incredible videography that goes into these things. It's like, if you can sit on your couch and watch this, why do you want to look at the, you know, out your window? Again, I acknowledge it as a context. I acknowledge the draw of it. Um, but want to do something else anyway. Let's see if I can make that. It's showing well. Okay. It doesn't forward normally through that. Um, I'm going to have to something. There we go. All right, so those are contexts, right? The sixth extinction is going on. It's a real thing. It's uh, the worst thing that's happening on the planet. And yet we have access to seeing all this beautiful life too. A um, couple of other things. I'm going to talk about wildlife close to home. That doesn't mean that uh, I'm not interested in getting away either. You know, over the course of my adult life, some of the greatest pleasures I've had uh, have taken place where, you know, you, you're in nature with a capital N. And this includes things like uh, fishing trips out west with my brother and my nephew and uh, catch a big, beautiful fish in beautiful places. Uh, so a few years back with my wife and my children in uh, Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado with Long's Peak behind us where the elk are cavorting. That's us in our campsite. And there's the moose that walked right through our campsite. You know, when I'm not away with my family, I have a fantastic job that allows me to travel with students a couple of times a year. Uh, this is a group 
the year before last in front of some of you will recognize some of you have been in a version of this photo. Uh, this is Leopold's Aldo Leopold's shack up uh, near Baraboo, Wisconsin. Um, and I also get to go to coast. My job is tough. I get to go to Costa Rica with a group of students from the Earth Society and Environmental Sustainability most years in the spring spring 2020 being an exception and what's not to like three-toed sloth looking at you white-faced capuchin monkey there speckle-bellied tanager long-tailed mannequin three-waddled bellbird this stuff is incredible right and students are are uh, properly wowed by it and i'm properly wowed by it anyway even in a good year and 2020 is not been a good year for travel or so many other things. Anyway, even in a good year, that's maybe three weeks out of the year. Where I am most of the time, where I suspect most of you are most of the time, well, I'm here at my house in Champaign um, or at my desk on campus putting together uh, presentations like this one. Uh, and here, if you look at it from a satellite, looks like this, right? And you'll notice that there are no, you know, the things I liked in those other pictures before the rivers full of trout and the mountains and the coast and the rainforest. There's no uh, coast here, no, no ocean view here. There's no mountains, there's no forest of any size. Uh, we are entirely surrounded and gulfed by. Uh, row crop agriculture, corn and soybeans primarily. And that's not a good place to go looking for nature, right? There is one kind of life in these fields and that's corn. They're designed to grow corn. Anything else that happens to be there, it's very little of it, but uh, somebody put this together a while back for a book uh, called One Life in One Square Foot, One Square Meter, One Square Some Unit of Measurement. Um, and the a guy uh, tried it in a cornfield and it's like, yeah, so we had a few insects, we have one arachnid, we have a fungus and a cornfield. There's not much there, no monkeys, no birds, no stuff. So we gotta be prepared to look for things uh, in other places. And that's the in-between spaces around here, um, home, work and, and uh, in the commute, you know, the, the travel between the two. Uh, I keep this pinned up above my desk on campus. It's the best fortune I ever got uh, from a fortune cookie that I think accurately describes what I'm trying to do in life, which is you discover treasures where others see nothing unusual. And of course, my goal is not to uh, show you, oh, I'm so good at this, but to show you I'm good at this I cultivate that, you can be good at it by cultivating that too. So I'm gonna start out just by showing photographs of the coolest stuff that I saw in my yard last spring. So, you know, mid-March last year, I started working from the room I'm in now. It looks more like a regular study than, than it actually is. What you can't see on the camera, of course, is that, you know, my son has, my son, my son who graduated from college this year has Legos in this room. My wife has lots of knitting things and chicken tchotchkes and I've cleaned it all up so that it looks like a regular study behind me. But anyway, I'm sitting in here starting last March and going into May doing classes on Zoom all the while, whenever weather allowed, um, with the sliding door open uh, so that I could hear the birds that are coming through. Cause one of the blessings of uh, life surrounded by cornfields is that all of the migrating birds that are going from Central America to, you know, the Northern tier states in Canada, these colorful things, the warblers and vireos and, and uh, other songbirds, uh, because we're surrounded by cornfields, they have to stop in town cause that's where the trees are. In fact, you know, what, what looks to us like houses and, and other, you know, human constructions with trees around them, 
if you look at it from the air, it's a forest that just happens to have some houses and stuff, you know, stuck into it. So these guys are happy when they're flying over the cornfield, they get to town. This is a black-throated blue warbler. This is my best look ever at one. It hung around my yard for a week. It was singing its head off. And, you know, it was very different. I did have to stop a class more than once to, to get out with my camera when this guy came by. Anyway, black-throated blue warbler was a highlight. Another highlight, this is a bad picture, but it's taken through the dirty window, um, a winter wren that stopped by. And that bird uh, was there specifically, you can't see it all in this picture, but uh, because I made a big stick pile uh, toward the back fence, uh, specifically to, to provide a little bit of a haven for birds, uh, this winter wren, which I usually only see in natural areas, actually hung around the yard last spring. So that's cool. Um, also hanging around last spring was a yellow-bellied sapsucker, which if you're of a certain age and you are not too proud to admit it, uh, you might recognize as the bird that Miss Jane Hathaway, Miss Jane Hathaway uh, was always chasing on the Beverly Hillbillies. And most people, if you say the name yellow-bellied sapsucker, think of it as some kind of joke. But in fact, it's one of the birds that, you know, uh, I see, see in my backyard in, in central Champaign. A couple of others from, from last spring. Uh, on the left is an Eastern Phoebe. It's a type of flycatcher. Um, conveniently says its own name. So you know, you'll, you know what you're hearing if you hear a bird that goes, Phoebe, Phoebe. And on the right is a Swainson's thrush, again, just passing through. But I, wanna, I shared these this evening in this presentation because being home allowed me to learn a little bit of something about the birds and the bees last spring. And it's not what you think. Here's the Phoebe. Here's the Swainson's thrush. So you can see that both of them have something to eat. What they've got and what I discovered that keeps them hanging around my yard is uh, they each have one of these. This is a digger bee, also known as polyester bee, also known as plasterer bee. So this is a solitary bee that uh, when the female's uh, ready to reproduce, she digs a little tunnel in, in uh, loose soil and then mates uh, this kind of little dance going on six inches above the ground of, of uh, males uh, as they look for females to mate with. Anyway, and then she, she pops down into this tunnel, deposits an egg there, covers it up and uh, is gone. The polyester or the plasterer bee in the name comes from the fact that she lines the, the sides of this tunnel with a, a, what's almost like a plastic substance. And now that I think about it, I'm thinking that's something that's it's like be spit uh, that, that uh, forms the lining. Anyway, so what I realized as I watched this is that I have digger bees in my yard, um, primarily in this area where this green stuff looks like grass, but that's actually a plant called uh, Carex jamesii, uh, lawn sedge or James's sedge. And it was growing when, when we moved into our place eight years ago, but uh, it, didn't, it didn't do really well because it had been mowed. And, and when I discovered that you know, this was a native sedge growing in the yard, I started cultivating it by you know, uh, not mowing it, letting it grow and pulling out other stuff that, that grew in between. So anyway, I had the sedge and unlike grass, which, you know, has that carpety growth pattern. This grows in, in little clumps and leaves bare soil in between. The bare soil leaves is, is uh, loose, is never compacted uh, by construction. And so uh, the digger bees uh, swarm there in April. Oh, and I say swarm, but they're, they're, they don't sting you. I, they can sting you, but they don't want to sting you. So I've laid on the ground taking photographs of them and they don't bother you. Anyway, sedge is there, leaves bare patches. Bare patches bring the bees to the yard. Bees bring the birds to the yard. So that was something cool I learned by being home last spring and looking out the window uh, in between doing other things. 
Um, some of the other birds that hang around the yard, you'll probably know this one, a Carolina wren. This is one of our birds that's around through the year and uh, unlike other birds, just doesn't ever stop singing. So if you go outside tomorrow and there's a little peak of sun, sun, sunshine and you hear a bird singing, uh, that's most, like most likely a Carolina wren. So uh, that one, we have a pair that hangs around the yard. Other birds that came through in the spring, here's a ruby-crowned kinglet, um, white-throated sparrow, uh, uh, Eastern wood peewee, not to be confused with the uh, Phoebe, also a fly catcher, also uh, just a cool bird to have in the neighborhood. And so these guys are, are posing on a stick that I set out in the yard about 30 feet away from the window so that I could, I'm actually was taking photographs last spring, not near home, but from home, like just with the door open, uh, and taking pictures outside. I guess I was farther outside for this. This is a least fly catcher that was also in the backyard. Oh, okay. So this is the end of the cool birds that came through my yard last spring, part of the presentation. And I make the transition here by pointing out that these are not birds that came here uh, because I have bird seed out. None of these eat bird seed. Um, they're in fact here because there are trees here. Uh, that provide the, the kind of food they need. And the kind of food they need is uh, insect larvae, caterpillars of uh, butterflies and moths. Uh, I'd like to take credit for having the, the genius idea of growing all these trees around my yard. But of course they were growing here before I moved in eight years ago. And they're mostly just a product of neglect that the guy who lived here before us uh, let the trees grow up all around the perimeter. Uh, he was kind of antisocial too. And so it was a way to screen the neighbors, I guess. Anyway, it turns out really cool to have all of this diversity of trees because these are the trees that then yeah, the insect them. larvae feed on and bring the birds to the yard in the spring. Um, and I don't know, again, I don't know if this will work for you students. When I play something like this in a class, they always just sit quiet, whether or not it's working for them. Uh, it's a little video that shows you the perimeter of the yard. And it's just, you know, I'm surrounded by uh, mature trees here. We're in the middle of Champagne. Oh, you can see also there are some domesticated birds that live in our yard in the chicken coop. Uh, back there. Anyway, so we got the trees to bring the birds. Now I have to figure out a way to stop this from going and go to the next slide, which uh, doesn't work the way. Um, let's just take a second to figure out because it doesn't. Ah, there we go. Okay, and to, to take that chain one step further, so you start with the sedge, you get the bees, you get the little birds, then also, of course, you have the big birds around um, to, to chase the, the little birds. This is a Cooper's hawk that, uh, well, one of the Cooper's hawks that visits our yard regularly. It used to be that they came looking for the little birds. Now they are primarily here looking for chickens. So they are birds non grata here. They are not welcome and we have to go out and chase them off. Uh, even uh, though the Cooper's hawk isn't that big compared to a chicken, they still want to eat them. All right, so those are birds of the yard and they're there in part because of the trees. And most of those are from pictures taken last spring. As spring gives way to summer, here's my transition into the next little part of this presentation, which is about the uh, shrubs of the yard, the, the next story down from the, the, the understory and the insects involved with them. Some of the master naturalists will recognize um, spice bush in this photograph. And I'm gonna take a quick look at my notes uh, to see, make sure I'm on the right page with this one. Uh, so spice bush is beautiful, as you can see in the spring with these yellow flowers that just pop, beautiful in its own right. Uh, but I planted it in my yard and, oh, I'll back up and say, 
I plant this in my yard thanks to the East Central Illinois Master Naturalists Native Tree and Shrub Sale, which I have uh, been a patron of since it started. And um, I planted spice bush uh, for a reason, and that was to attract spice bush swallowtails to my yard. So this is a spice bush swallowtail butterfly. Uh, sitting on a spice bush leaf that I photographed because I wanted to get a picture of the butterfly itself. But I, without realizing it, it also got a nice picture of the egg that this butterfly had just laid there. And here's why I posted the, um, why I started planting spice bush to begin with as an, as an understory shrub in the yard. I wanted to see spice bush swallowtail caterpillars. Um, it's kind of unprepossessing here. It looks like bird poop by design that avoids predators. That's one of the ways it avoids being eaten by the birds that come to the yard. But it also, you can see, um, and again, I'm not entirely sure whether you can see me mousing over this or not, but uh, the webbing there on the leaf where the, the swallowtail caterpillar is, um, was put there by the caterpillar. And as that webbing, you know, the, the caterpillar extrudes that, well, I don't know where that comes out, but somewhere, um, it's wet. And as it dries, it pulls that leaf together along the vein where it's been put down and makes a little tent for the caterpillar. So it looks like poop. That's one way it avoids being eaten. Another way is just to avoid being seen. So here it is folded up in its little tent. Um, and this is, to go back, this is why I, why I put spice bush in my yard because I had seen pictures of these caterpillars in books before. I'd never seen one in the wild, and I thought, "Huh, I wonder if I could put that plant in my yard and have them there." And it, it turns out it works. So uh, this is an entertainment that we have in our yard every summer now. Um, so thanks to the master naturalists, I now have one, two, three, four, five. All of these, uh, more than a dozen different types of native shrubs. So I moved in here eight years ago and I started uh, taking out uh, uh, privet, a hedge that, that went all the way around the back of the yard and replacing it with all of these native shrubs. So we went from a, an invasive exotic plant that uh, provided almost no benefit to wildlife to all of these plants, which each one of them provides a, a distinct benefit to some group of, of insects, the, the larvae of which, which feed on them. Um, so the thing we were looking at before was uh, spice bush with the spice bush swallowtail caterpillars. This is wafer ash, and those are tiger swallowtail caterpillars. You notice the pattern here. Um, there's the tiger swallowtail adult. This is another tiger swallowtail adult, but the, the picture here is really to show pawpaw. This, the leaf it's on is a pawpaw, and uh, that's a source of food for a zebra swallowtail. That's one I haven't seen in the yard yet, but we have the, the food for it if it's ready to eat some leaves. Um, this is a larvae of a caterpillar of a giant swallowtail. Look a lot like the other ones. As it grows up, it also wants to look like a snake and does a pretty good job of that. That's giant swallowtail on prickly ash. That's the giant swallowtail adult there. Again, these are all these pictures are all taken of things that I think they're just stunningly beautiful. And they're all in my backyard. And they're in my backyard because I did something different in my backyard than you know was done before. That's the giant swallowtail underside. Oh, and the, this is the one you probably, any everybody knows uh, who tries to grow a little bit of dill or parsley around here. Um, the black swallowtail, which is again, one of the coolest little things around um, and will eat your parsley until there's nothing left of it, but it's a good trade-off. Look at that thing. Okay, and, and it's not just, those, you know, I like monarchs too, and they, I don't have enough sun to grow uh, any milkweeds for them, but they do nectar on some of the plants here. This is nectaring on, uh, 
a kind of bone set. I forget which one it is now. Anyway, it grows around the yard. So I like having monarchs around too. And, you know, that's cool. Um, I also stop long enough to appreciate the, the weirder things. The cicadas are my favorite just for weird things. Um, imagine, you know, two, three years, however long it's been underground. I know that they're called annual cicadas, but it, depending on conditions, uh, these larvae may be, be underground for longer than that. They're in the yard. What else is there? Oh, my new favorite is uh, this plant is called uh, Agastache scrofularia folium. I mean, it sounds like I'm making up the specific name, but I'm not. Agastache scrofularia folium uh, or giant blue or giant purple hyssop is another name for it that a friend of mine gave me. Again, this is a native plant. This draws bumblebees like you wouldn't believe. The reason I was able to get such a sharp picture of this is that they actually, for some reason, they love to sleep on this. And if you didn't know it, bumblebees sleep and they don't have to go home to do it. They just sleep right on their favorite foods. And so I have this growing in the front of my yard and every morning in August, I go out and check on the, the, the bee population uh, that's sleeping on there before the sun gets on them in the morning. Okay, so birds, other things that fly, insects, and of course, just uh, when you have a general kind of healthy yard, you have other things that live there too, especially snakes. Uh -huh. This is, these are uh, plains garter snakes. I don't, our part of Champaign, and I know a lot of parts of Urbana are probably better habitat for these snakes than ever existed uh, for them, you know, before people started building houses. Uh, they, they're just, they are right at home here. Uh, and to me, again, it's kind of cool. Do I like to see, you know, bigger, more charismatic snakes elsewhere? Sure. But uh, as long as I got something like this, that that's uh, uh, something I'll, I, I, I will stop and, and look at them. All right. So I figure you've been staying home enough and I've been staying home enough and we've been in my backyard for long enough now that maybe just move on a little bit to this can be its own show. Um, I also, so I ride my bicycle to work from the central part of Champaign over to campus at the U of I. And this is uh, me taking pictures at the second street basin. I, happened to have this picture because a student of mine came by and saw me there and, and uh, being a student of mine, she took a picture <laughs> and uh, it worked out kind of cool because at the time she was taking that picture, I was taking this picture. Um, and so I just want to do a brief stop here at the Second Street Basin to appreciate the fact that in the middle of town, and I'll connect this to my yard where the things that I have planted, the choices I have made have, you know, improved the, the lot of wildlife and improved my own lot at, at the same time. Um, the city of Champaign chose well here to improve the lot of wildlife when they uh, did the redesign the or the design for uh, this part of the floodwater storage in Champaign at the Second Street Basin you have uh, Springfield there on the south and you have uh, enough capacity to hold an awful lot of water there but since that capacity isn't used all that time, most of the time what you have there is a park with a little bit of natural area built into it. There's prairie planting along the edge and the uh, pond there in the middle. So you get red-eared sliders, you get spiny soft-shell turtles, and I don't have anything in here for scale, but this animal is about 18 inches from the front to the back of the carapace there, 20, four, 25 inches altogether. It's a big animal. The snapping turtle, again, uh, it's a big one. Uh, and all of these things live there because the city of Champaign, instead of, you know, putting the water storage in concrete vaults under a turf grass field, which is one of the other proposals for this, instead, you know, made an amenity out of uh, that stormwater storage. 
right in the middle of town and it's available for people to enjoy. There's another turtle there, another turtle. Um, frogs enjoy the boneyard. I enjoy the frogs. Uh, snakes, and uh, these are plains garter snakes again, enjoy the landscaping on campus and I enjoy finding them there. This is one of my uh, best snake finding partners. This is my daughter um, from, she's graduated in 2017 from, but back when she was a student, uh, every once in a while she would call me up and say, hey, you wanna go catch snakes at lunch? And I'd say, sure. And so we did. Um, Okay, so we've gotten from home to Second Street to campus, oh, to the Boneyard Creek. I didn't, I, I have, uh, one of the things that you've noticed maybe is that I, I have different strategies for, for uh, experiencing and enjoying wildlife. One of my more cockamamie schemes of recent years was to uh, set up a GoPro uh, in the Boneyard Creek. This is uh, just upstream of Second Street where the, the creek runs under uh, white. And I took a still from that because I, I don't trust the video to play and I just want people to be able to appreciate. This is a long year sunfish. The Boneyard Creek is full of these guys. And it's just, it's just beautiful. You know, if you were walking through a zoo and you uh, hit the, aquarium and you would stop at the exhibit and so look at the colors on that fish that is beautiful and yet most people you know don't realize they're swimming around the boneyard creek uh all year long this happens to be in june when i when i set this camera up um when these these uh male long ear sunfish which this is one the they get all colored up like this and they make a nest in the gravel. So all that clean, clean gravel surrounding this fish, it's about the size of a dinner plate and he has cleaned it up and he's waiting for a female to come by and mate with him and uh, leave eggs there, which he will then fertilize and guard. Um, so, and because there's a healthy fish population in the Boneyard Creek, there's uh, fish eating birds supported by the Boneyard Creek. This is a belted kingfisher. Someday in the not too distant future, perhaps the mascot of the University of Illinois um, caught this bird catching dinner on my way home one afternoon. Uh, other fish eating birds there include the pied billed grebe, uh, little, this is a green heron. Oh, and you'll see that this is not eating a fish, but it's got a crab apple in its bill. And this is another discovery I made uh, by stopping to watch something. Uh, this bird was, I, I saw it drop a crab apple in the water and I thought, oh, it was trying to hold on to that thing and just lost it. But that wasn't the case. It dropped the crab apple and let it float for a little bit pick it up and drop it again, pick it up, drop it again. I was like, what the heck is going on there? And I didn't know, you know, I didn't see anything further happen. I, at uh, some point I just had to stop taking pictures and go home for dinner. As you might guess, I'm late getting home, late getting to work uh, when the burning is really good. Anyway, this uh, green heron was, I, I looked it up when I got home, they actually fish. So it's a bird after my own heart. Um, they'll pick up a feather, they'll pick up a, a crab apple or just a little bit of something that they drop onto the water to draw fish, you know, have little fish uh, pop up to investigate to see if it's food for them. And as they do, sometimes they become food for the heron. Uh, also great blue heron that hangs around there uh, at Second Street. So those are some of the, the things that, you know, it's like, okay, you can see those in between home or I can see those in between home and work and makes my day better. It's not Costa Rica. It's not Colorado. It's not uh, Montana, but it is wildlife and, and it's the, the place where I am uh, more often than those other places. Uh, okay. And so rather than, <laughs> I was going to, normally this talk includes a, a, a little bit of a walk around campus to see birds there, but I thought people are so cooped up now um, that I might take you a little bit away from home and just 
uh, show some photographs of birds that I've seen recently. So uh, once the semester ends in mid uh, December for me, um, and before the spring semester starts, and when I have a little bit of time, uh, I do a lot of birding in the winter, and it's almost unaffected by COVID. I can go out birding by myself. My friends and I have to drive separate, you know, when we go places. But otherwise, this is a pursuit that uh, can go on as usual. And I've had some really good luck in the past few weeks uh, with birds going out to look with my camera. So, and, oh, the point of this is that these are things you can do, right? That this this doesn't take any special skill. This is just driving around the South Farms and looking at the posts and seeing what's perched there uh, on the fence post. So this is across the street from the University of Illinois Credit Union uh, a couple of weeks ago. This is an American kestrel and it's sitting up on that perch, not to look pretty, but because it wants to uh, jump down and grab a, a vole um, for dinner. This is a red-tailed hawk also on a post, also on the South Farms, just you know, block and a half from the credit union. This one already has gotten dinner. I didn't put the whole sequence in here, but I watched this happen. I uh, was doing a Christmas bird count on campus uh, and my, my group had split up to get lunch and I had gotten some fast food and I was driving around looking for a place to eat. And I came across this bird this red-tailed hawk perched on a post and stayed put while I got my camera out and uh, hopped down and grabbed a vole for its lunch. Uh, while, while, well, I wasn't actually able to eat because I was taking pictures of it. So my curly fries were stone cold when I got back to them. But anyway, uh, this is on campus, available to see. These are ducks at Kaufman Lake, you know, in, in I took this last Saturday. I just stopped by there and they're on a 1500, maybe 2000 mallards. It was kind of hard to tell because they're tucked up under the far bank, but in with them are black ducks, which this uh, pair, the one right in the center and then the, the one on the left. There's a hooded merganser in there. These are things that you can see from your car, you know? Uh, so if you're stir crazy, I guess my suggestion is sometimes you don't have to be uh, a, an experienced birder to go out with a pair of binoculars and find the, the odd duck, if you'll excuse me for that. Um, and bald eagle from a bird count out near Allerton uh, this past weekend. Uh, it's one of the coolest stories, I think. Oh, I'm not going to tell any more stories. Anyway, it's neat for somebody my age to be able to go out and see a bald eagle because I grew up thinking I would never see a bald eagle in the wild. But that's also, you know, it's visible to anybody who keeps their eyes open when they're uh, near a river in central Illinois. I'm going to wrap up here, uh, coming back home to uh, pictures that I've taken in the backyard in the uh, recent weeks. So this is a downy woodpecker. Obviously, I have a camera that is really made for, and lens that's made for doing this kind of photography. So this is in my backyard. This is in my backyard. You notice a certain similarity between the thing that they're perched on. It's an old branch from a walnut tree, but it's not a branch that's on the walnut tree any longer. It's uh a branch that's attached to the post that holds up my bird feeders, <laughs> um, put there specifically so that woodpeckers would stop and have their to have their pictures taken on their way to the the suet feeder, and it works out that they do that. All right, so back to the yard. Oh, and you can see the chickens in that picture too. Um, just to to emphasize that that stuff. You don't have to wait for spring to see birds in your backyard. You don't have to, you know, uh, have great eyesight or, or great birding skills to go out and see what's perched on the post. So there are some things to do um, to, to get out locally now. Um, and that's the end of the slideshow. So I'm going to stop the sharing and just invite other, uh, I guess, the, the way this is, works is that Amanda is going to look at questions in, oh, in the chat and tell me what to do. Or Elizabeth is? Sure. Well, I think that the 
most important question um, was actually asked by two people. And we want to know about your camera and your lens with these beautiful pictures. Uh, I'm not hearing you, Elizabeth. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear Elizabeth. Talking to oh, can you hear me? Can yes. you hear me now? Hello? Hello? I can, I can hear you, Elizabeth. Um, let's see. Amanda, why don't you ask the questions if you can? Well, Rob, can you hear me? Yes. Interesting. <laughs> okay. Um, the question uh, is, uh, what kind of camera and lens are you using? Ah, 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 ah. Um, well, now I'm trying to decide whether I should just go get it and show you. Uh, <laughs> right now I have a Nikon D500 DSLR with uh, a, a lens that's uh, a 500 millimeter uh, zoom lens. It's, uh, it's really, really nice. Um, but I've I've had that for the past few months. Prior to that, I had a Canon Mark uh, Canon 70 and a 100 to 100 to 400 millimeter zoom lens, and uh, that was in my car overnight this summer. And I think I left the car unlocked, and well, I left it there, and it, it went away. Anyway, so yeah, a DSLR with a a, a zoom a really good zoom lens. Nice. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of very um, active photographers in our group. Yeah, then um, that's one thing. I, I give my students a hard time because I also take a lot of pictures with my phone, which, you know, it's an iPhone. It's a fantastic camera. Um, and for a lot of the photography people do, you know, you can well, when I do insects, all the insects are with the, the phone or most of the insects are with the phone and stuff. I, I always try to mix in photographs so that people can't say, oh, you must have a really good camera. I would say, well, yeah, I do. But I also have the one you carry around in your pocket. Um, and, you know, I encourage people to learn to use what they have. But if you want to shoot birds, you got to have a telephoto, a good telephoto lens. Fabulous. Okay, it looks like we have one more question. It says, uh, do you ever have to take into consideration not disturbing the animals that you are observing? How do you draw a balance between getting close enough to see and staying far enough away to not disturb them? That is a really interesting question. So, uh, because it, the telephoto lens doesn't do everything for you, right? I, I mean, even if you have a telephoto lens, uh, you really need to be much closer to, to things than, than most people ever get. I mean, that I'm taking pictures from 15 feet away, not 50 feet away. Um, what's interesting is that uh, in most cases, if I'm close to an animal, it's because it got close to me, not the other way around. It's just impossible to, to or difficult to stalk uh, most animals. And it's far easier to sit still and, and to let them come to you. So I, I do a lot of sitting still and just disappearing. And it's weird to say, but I, I just, that I have, that's something that I've cultivated. And it's really interesting to see, especially with the little birds, you know, if you sit down and don't move and don't talk and just be there uh, 10 or 15 minutes later, nothing cares that you're there. You know, if you're not moving, if you're not talking, uh, you can, you know. So yeah, my, my best advice is, don't go after things, let things come to you. Anticipate where they're gonna be and put yourself there uh, first. That said, I probably worry a lot less about that than some people do. This is different from Chicago where, you know, you have people baiting owls and, and stuff like that. I would never, you know, wanna do that um, or participate in that, but uh, yeah, yeah. The main thing, I, I worry less that uh, people will scare animals and more that people won't, uh, that people won't 
connect with animals because they're scared of scaring them. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, good, good. Okay, it looks like we have another one. Um, what model binoculars do you use? Uh, the current ones I have are Zeiss Conquest, I think. But well, I mean, that's the current ones I have. I don't like them and I don't recommend them. <laughs> uh, but there are lots of good ones out there. If you're looking for binoculars, I would recommend uh, visiting uh, a site that the New York Times runs. It's called the Wire Cutter. Um, and they do product tests and they recommend one it's around $300 now that competes with some of the much more expensive binoculars. And I bought a pair of those for my daughter last year. And I, those are really nice. Anyway, so take a look at the wire cutter for, for uh, binocular recommendations. Cool. Okay. And uh, how long? Oh, also, wait, 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 Sorry. Amanda. Okay. No worries. Oh, and take your damn binoculars with you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I can't tell you how many people say oh, I was, I was driving and I saw blah, blah, blah. And I, but I didn't have binoculars. I'm like, where were your binoculars? Like the, the reason to spend some money on these things is because they're made to, to be used that way, to have with you all the time. If you want to open up your world, that's one of the best ways to do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You have to bring your DSLR too. You gotta I, to I do. <laughs> right. right. Okay. The last question I see is how long did you grow the spice bush before you got caterpillars? It was, I planted it in the fall and I had them the next spring. It's not a, you know, it's like, it's not a guarantee. None of that stuff is, but it, it just, and, and I mean, this is something that master naturalists know, you know, the, the, the enjoyment comes from just trying it. Who knows, you know, like, uh, but no, that stuff. And, and again, those things, I planted spice bush because I wanted to see the caterpillars, but I planted prickly ash because it has those berries that, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but they numb your mouth. And I thought that was just a cool trick. And I planted them for that. And they, they've never produced berries. I don't, I don't know why, but uh, they have attracted those cool caterpillars and giant swallowtails, which I wouldn't have known you could find in town. Nice. All right, let's see if we're getting more. Um, uh... Where do you have the best luck looking for salamanders in our area? Um, the, I, I mean, I always look at the ones out at uh, Busey Woods uh, because <laughs> that's, there are smallmouth salamanders there and they're really, really accessible. Um, sometimes if you can find your way to the uh, vernal pools out along the middle fork in, in Kickapoo and you just got to kind of do a little bit of traipsing around to find where where there's water standing there in the spring a lot of times you can well yeah look for standing water I, I, I mean Vermilion County is a, a better place uh, although uh, Busey Woods has smallmouth salamanders in the spring. Well, um, I don't see any other questions, um, but I've been I've enjoyed all of your photos and, and stories. Oh, let's see. Okay. Uh, with your great grandma, this may be a silly one, but uh, on the edge of our seats. <laughs> Who's going to ask a question like that? <laughs> oh, <laughs> do you edit your photos? My oh, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> Because I, I uh, well, here's the thing that, that I have, and all, all photographers, you know, make their own choices about this, but I adjust lighting, sharpness, you know, and I cropped them and, and color a little bit, but I never put anything in or take anything out. So if I can't crop something out, it stays, you know, in, in the picture. And if something wasn't there, I don't put it in. So it, it's always got to be, you know, what, uh, a scene that the eye could have seen. Nice. All right. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie found the binos. <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, anyway, yeah. yeah. Well, I hope I, I you know, I really do. Uh, this is, I always tell my students, of course, the world's going to hell in a handbasket, but that doesn't mean you have to spend all your time fretting about it, really. You know, you can, you can get yourself ready to deal with it by, by taking care of yourself. And you take care of yourself by taking care of the world around you, you know, so. Right. I think this uh, works very well. Uh, a couple of months ago, we had Doug Calamay talking about, you know, bringing nature home. Oh, so totally. Yeah. I'm sorry I didn't mention that. <laughs> oh no worries yeah no this this totally goes along um with kind of you know what we want to tell the world is you know control what you can <laughs> um, and that might be you know your backyard and, and what you decide to plant so yeah yeah no he's the inspiration for 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 doing that with the yard and it, it's just it's life-changing to me you know thinking of the world that way yeah yeah and uh you know, this is our community that that also uh, has those values, and so we appreciate you coming and 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 sharing your evening with us. And uh, um, thank you so much. All right, thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Bye. See you.